So we've talked about how Nanograv observes the repeating light signals from these distant pulsars to detect gravitational waves. Now when we think of observing distant astrophysical objects, we often think of telescopes where we look through an eyepiece and see a magnified image of the light coming from those objects. However, pulsars don't give off much visible light at all. The pulsar signals that are given off are mostly in the form of radio waves, which are invisible to the human eye. Observing these different frequencies of light require different kinds of telescopes, and in this video we'll look at the radio telescopes that are used by Nanograph. Let's start by looking at the different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Well, all of the light that we see is actually electromagnetic waves, oscillating combinations of electric and magnetic fields. And these waves can have different wavelengths and frequencies, and our eyes will perceive these different wavelengths and frequencies as different colors. For example, red light has the longer wavelengths, around 700 nanometers, and lower frequencies, whereas blue and violet light will have shorter wavelengths and higher frequencies. But the entire set of colors that we can see is only one small part of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. If I look at higher frequencies and shorter wavelengths and go past blue light, I'll get to ultraviolet light, then keep going to x-rays, and eventually get to gamma rays, the highest energy uh, waves that we have. Going the other way, if I go past red light and look at longer wavelengths and lower frequencies, I get infrared waves, microwaves, and finally radio waves. And all of these different kinds of waves are just different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And in astronomy, we find that different objects will tend to emit different frequencies of light. For instance, here's a Hubble image of the Crab Nebula, and this is looking at the visible light. And then we have an image of the same object in the radio waves, and we see that when we look at the radio waves, different parts of this object are going to be highlighted. So let's look at how we detect these, uh, these different kinds of waves. Now, fundamentally, all light-based telescopes operate the same way. They collect electromagnetic radiation, focus it, and measure it. For example, in regular optical telescopes, the kind that we're used to, visible light passes through an aperture, the end of the telescope, and inside the telescope, it is focused by a series of mirrors or lenses. And the resulting image can either be observed directly through the eyepiece or recorded as an image. And this works great for visible light. However, microwaves and radio waves have such lower frequencies compared to visible light that they cannot be observed with normal telescopes and we need different methods to observe them. So here we have a picture of a radio telescope and these telescopes generally consist of a large dish which is shaped to reflect radio waves to a single focal point. So wherever the radio waves hit, they always go to this focal point. And here we set a receiver antenna which converts the radio waves to an electrical signal which can be measured. Now if this dish is larger, the telescope will be able to collect more radio waves, so the telescope will generally have a greater sensitivity. It also depends on the antenna that is built into here, how sensitive that antenna actually is. And these receivers are generally tuned to specific radio frequencies or ranges of frequencies, depending on what we're actually trying to observe. Now, Nanograv is fortunate enough to have access to two of the world's best radio telescopes the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, and the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia. Now, Arecibo, pictured here, which you may recognize from a number of different movies, has a dish that's 305 meters across. And even this image does not do justice to how large this telescope is. You can see a couple of buildings over here that are simply dwarfed by the size of this dish. Now, the antennas for this radio telescope are actually housed in this structure, which is suspended over the telescope. To point the telescope at different locations in the sky, this dish itself is clearly too large to be moved. So it's aimed by moving the receiver over the telescope. And the shape of this dish 
is such that as the receiver is moved, it will be focused on radio waves from different locations in the sky. The downside of this design is that Arecibo still can't see more than 20 degrees away from directly above itself. So there is a significant fraction of the sky lower down on the horizon that Arecibo can never see. So to observe these parts of the sky, we also have the Green Bank Telescope, which at 105 meters across is currently the world's largest fully steerable radio telescope. This entire structure can rotate 360 degrees on this track that you see down here, and the entire thing can also be tilted, allowing us to point it anywhere in the sky. So as our radio waves come in and hit the telescope, they're all reflected back to this same focal point, and that is where we have our receiver, our antenna, which allows us to measure these radio waves. And there are a number of members of NanoGrav that have worked on and continue to develop upgrades to the antennas and the receivers, increasing their sensitivity to the pulsar signals that we're looking for. Now, although we have some of the best radio telescopes in the world, there are some fundamental difficulties with observing radio waves. One of which is that in today's society, we produce vast quantities of microwave and radio wave transmissions. Radio, TV, cell phone transmissions, any kind of wireless data transmission, all operate in the radio and microwave frequencies. Even power lines that are carrying AC current produce radio waves. So there are a lot of these sources of artificial radio waves that are filling the air around us with these, with these different signals. And this produces a lot of background noise in our telescope that we refer to as radio frequency interference, or RFI. And this can make it very difficult to identify our faint pulsar signal from all of these different artificial sources. It's kind of like trying to hear a whisper from across a room full of talking people. However, various methods have been developed to try to either block or filter out or at least minimize the effects from this radio frequency interference. Now, even after we've tried to eliminate as many of these noise sources as possible, when we point our radio telescope at a given pulsar, the individual pulses are generally not strong enough to be seen over the background noise. So we get a data stream from the telescope that looks something like this. Now, this is just a simulation of a noisy data stream with a regular pulsar signal in it. But the individual pulses are too weak to be seen above the noise. The individual pulses are in there, but the noise is so high that we can't actually see where these pulses are occurring at. Now, let's say that we already know in advance that we have a pulsar in here with a period of 10 milliseconds. Well, we can build a usable signal out of this noisy data by using a technique known as folding the data. So what we do is we take our entire data stream and cut it into 10 millisecond chunks. So there's the first 10 milliseconds, there's the next 10 milliseconds, and we do this for our entire data stream. Well, if we add up or overlay our data, so we take all of the data in here and just add it on to what we had here, we take all of this data and add it on. As we do this more and more, the pulse signal will be built up while the noise that we have in here is generally going to cancel out. So this is what we get as we fold over five pulses. And at this level, we still see that it's, it's basically still noise. I can't really discern where any signal is coming out of this. But as we integrate or fold over longer and longer times over more pulses, at 100 pulses, we start to see that there's a spike occurring at about two and a half seconds. And as we continue to integrate over 2,000 pulses, then we get an increasingly accurate pulse profile. And again, this is a simulated data set, but I've applied this exact method to this simulated data set, and this is the exact same thing that we do with actual radio telescope data. For real pulsar observations, we will generally observe each one for 15 to 30 minutes, which corresponds usually to tens to hundreds of thousands of pulses. 
and we fold the data in exactly this way to get our averaged pulse profile. And it is this averaged pulse profile that is very stable for each pulsar and that we can time to very high precision. Now, we assumed at the beginning of this that we already knew there was a pulsar there and we already knew what its period was. And initially finding these pulsars and measuring their pulse periods is a difficult task that we'll talk more about in future videos when we talk about pulsar searches. We'll also talk at that time more about a number of programs that members of Nanograv are involved with in professional outreach, getting high school students to help us with some of these real pulsar searches. Put a quick drop for the Pulsar Search Collaboratory and the Arecibo Remote Command Center. But before that, I want to talk about one other property that is very important to pulsar timing, which is pulsar delays due to the interstellar medium. So, as these radio pulsar signals move from the pulsar to the Earth, they're actually not moving through completely empty space. There's tiny amounts of dust and gas that are in the interstellar space, which we refer to as the interstellar medium or ISM. And in a similar way that as visible light moves through a prism, the light is going to be dispersed and scattered, in the very same way, the radio pulsar signals that travel through the ISM are going to be scattered and dispersed. And this can cause a number of changes to the pulsar signal, which overall will cause the pulse to be delayed, and we need to know how to account for this timing delay. Well, it turns out that in the same way that the different frequencies of visible light are scattered and dispersed by the prism by different amounts, the radio waves moving through the ISM are going to be delayed by different amounts based on their frequencies. The signals from our pulsars usually span a range of radio frequencies, and it turns out that the lower frequency parts of the signal are going to be delayed more by the ISM than the higher frequency parts. So over here we have a figure that shows a range of radio frequencies from about 1.2 to 1.5 gigahertz. And we can see from this dark band when the different frequency parts of the signal actually arrived at the telescope. So we see that the high frequency parts of our signal arrived a little bit sooner, whereas the low frequency parts of the pulse arrived a little bit later at our telescope. And the exact shape of this curved line tells us about how much interstellar dust and gas is between us and the pulsar. And we refer to this as the dispersion measure, or DM. So if we have a larger DM, there's more interstellar dust between us and the pulsar, but once we have this measurement, we can accurately account for the timing delay caused by the interstellar medium. And there's a large group within Nanograv that is focused on improving our methods of measuring and accounting for the effect of this interstellar medium, both through data analysis methods and improving the antennas of the radio telescopes themselves. Because in order to measure and account for this effect, we need to have radio telescopes and antennas that are sensitive to a range of different frequencies. So it's very fortunate that Nanograv has access to two of the best radio telescopes in the world, Arecibo and the Green Bank Telescope, which are again fantastic tools to work with. But we are also always finding ways to improve both the telescopes themselves and how we use these telescopes for pulsar timing. And we will talk more about these active Nanograv projects and the people who are working on them in the next video.